There are many predictions about the future, and we all have them, and they're all different. So for today's show, we're going to try our hand at it. Of course, uh, we're going to give some predictions for the remainder of the NBA season. You know, we know in the world of sports, anything can happen. Injuries, benches, firings, you name it, it can happen. So these takes that we have are going to be very interesting to look back on in just a few months. Uh, of course, I'm joined by my co-host, Bakari Steve. How you feeling? How you doing today? On this Tuesday rainy morning, I feel good. You know, uh, the rain helped me sleep last night, so I'm ready to get to it. Yeah, uh, this is your early reminder. You guys have been killing it on the support as of late. We really can't thank you guys enough for that. But if you do enjoy what you're seeing, hearing, any of that, support us down below. Drop us a like, uh, drop a comment. We love interacting with you guys. And of course, hit that big red button if you haven't already. But without further ado, I'm your host, Owen Stiftar. And let's get into this uh, list of news that we have to cover. Uh, starting here with Damian Lillard, of course, we had to bring it to today's show. Um, this past Sunday, Damian Lillard dropped 71 points in a game in just 39 minutes of play. Uh, he had 41 in the first half. He ended with 71, which 71, believe it or not, he's, he, he's the second person this season to hit that mark. Obviously, Donovan Mitchell for the Cavs. He hit that mark early in the season, but Damian Lillard's was different because he had probably the most efficient, highest scoring game ever, if that makes any sense, of the top four scoring games ever, uh, or top five. Um, he had one of the most efficient games ever uh, when, when you score that amount of points. But I wanted to ask you, is it being overshadowed, you know, with all the great performances this season? You know, Donovan Mitchell, like I mentioned, he had 71. On that same day, Donovan Mitchell had 71. Klay Thompson had 54. Luca, he had he's had three games of 60, 51, and 50 this year, and alone for this season, we've had 21 games of 50 or more points around the league. Is Dame 71 being overshadowed? Uh, I think because of uh, Dame, the player it is. Um, I think everybody knows that Damian Lillard is a he's he's a he's obviously one of the best scorers in NBA history. But, uh, I mean, he's been on a tear these, like, I think the last 13 games. And it's like he doesn't really get the, the credit he deserves, maybe because he's ringless, maybe because he's he ain't never ran from the grind in Portland, which he needed to a long time ago. Small market. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, I think, I mean, it got it got enough attention, I feel like. Uh, I mean, he obviously he scored 71 points, but I feel like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, when you think about it, it was 71 against the Houston Rockets, who they were blowing out at halftime. Yes. Um. Obviously, you know, I, I once he had 41 and a half, I thought he was going to, you know, try and get 80 because that's how good of a score Damian Lillard is. Like he catches fire, he won't let down. Um, but but he he you know he settled for 71 and uh, you know it, I mean it was a really impressive game. Yeah, I mean I think he had 13 threes, which was a career high. Again, he bar- he shot. Uh, I can't remember the number, but it was super efficient from the field, which makes this game even more impressive. You know, let alone that he already hit 71 points. But, you know, there, there's been a lot of great scoring performances, and maybe, you know, the NBA does have a scoring problem, but that's just where we're at today um, in the in the fast-paced game that we all see now, uh, see now. excuse me. But LeBron James, with a foot injury, he's likely to miss an extended amount of time. Um, they had a, an amazing 27-point comeback. Yeah. You know, the, uh, what was it, yesterday or two days ago against, Sunday, the Maver- yeah. uh, against the Mavericks? Yeah, I want to yeah. say it was Sunday or Saturday, one of those two. Yeah, it was one of those two. But LeBron, he got hurt in that game. <laughs> Even after this injury, we know LeBron. He gets hurt. Um, you know, he is the king, but he's also one heck of an actor, right? LeBron James will get hurt like this many times. He'll get right back up, and he'll, and he'll go and dunk on two of your uh, best players like nothing happened. Which, I guess that's what comes with LeBron James, but I guess... When LeBron says he's hurt, he's hurt, and right now all we know is that he's going to miss some time. Do you think that really derails this Lakers season? As it seems like they're just getting everything going. Uh, I think it does. Um, whenever, whenever you go uh, crazy at the trade deadline like the Lakers do, it's going to take some time. You'll have good and bad moments with your new group. Um, LeBron has only played with the new people they traded for. I think what once or twice. Um, and when you take them out for an extended extended period of time, especially when they're trying to make a playoff push, it could look ugly if they are in the play in and they haven't had. I mean, it's LeBron, of course, but you know it could it could go negatively. Yeah, uh, we both have a prediction about the Lakers later on in the episode, and I'll dive more into why I think this injury might not derail the Lakers season as much as most would think. But 
again, the Lakers, anytime LeBron James goes down, it's going to make it harder to win games. But this time around, they have a lot better of a supporting cast. And Anthony Davis is playing better this season. But LeBron, hopefully he gets better soon as uh, they're, they're trying to make a playoff push. Next up is Lomelo Ball, another young star who got hurt. He hurt his right ankle. I think he fractured his right ankle, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> but Lamelo Ball, he's probably out for the remainder of the season. The Hornets are 20 and 43 or something like that. The Hornets suck. Uh, there's really no point for him to come back and even risk getting hurt again. Yeah, um, they. Yeah, there's like you said, there's no point. Um, there really wasn't. I mean, once he had like two or three ankle sprains and they were pretty bad early in the season, there really wasn't a point to keep him playing. I guess other than to um, keep him in game shape or whatever, get him more reps. But, I mean, he was an all-star last year on a, uh, what, a ninth seed team that made the play-in. Um, obviously, they're in the full Wimbenaya uh, sweepstakes, so um, I'm sure they don't have too bad of a problem with it. They just want him to heal up and take as much time as he needs in this recovery so he can come back better than ever. Yeah, I mean, this team, they're going to have a lot of moving pieces this offseason. I think Gordon Hayward, Terry Rozier, um, they already moved Plumley. Yeah. You know, they're going to have a lot of the veteran pieces – Kelly Oubre um, move this offseason and because they're probably not going to bring him back maybe Oubre but I, this team's going to look a lot different next year like you said they're in the Webb and Yama sweepstakes maybe they can pull that off or maybe even with a playmaking guard like LaMelo maybe they can sneak in a Scoot Henderson there uh, at the two guard spot or Brandon Miller that would be a or, combination or Brandon Miller if he can beat the charge <laughs> um, next up is Nerlens Noel uh he just got bought out by the Detroit Pistons, uh, and he's on the move. You know, he's going to be looking to join some contenders. You know, the Trailblazers are in the mix. The Lakers are in the mix. The Mavericks are in the mix. What What's a team that you would like to see New Orleans Noel on going uh, forward? As I mean, he, he's a nice uh, rim-protecting big, and he could stretch the floor a little bit. You know, nothing too crazy. Uh, yeah, I, I personally, I want to see him back. He was in Dallas the one time, I think, and he, that's when he turned down all that money and everybody was mm-hmm. kind of like, what are you doing? But mm-hmm. uh, I, I need, I want to see him go back to Dallas because Dallas desperately needs a big, desperately. Um, you know, I, I know it's kind of, it's it's weird because they have big men on their roster, but Christian Wood, he doesn't play like a big man. He more, He's more so a perimeter big. Uh, yeah, he's a four yeah, at heart. They don't play JaVale McGee. Reggie Bullock, he's 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 average at best when he plays his wing. He's not good when he when they have him playing big. Tim Hardaway obviously can't play big. Um, that's the reason that they are they're able to lose games uh, when they're up twenty seven points to a struggle or I guess a revamping Lakers team. Um, you know you can't rest it all on Kyrie and Luca's shoulders. They can't play defense either. Nerlens Well can at least you know step in front of somebody on their way to the paint. Yeah, I mean, we just saw it before we uh, loaded up today's show and, and uh, we're ready to record. The Mavs are 1-3 and three when Luka and Kyrie play together. Um, so, obviously, there's some chemistry issues there still. But they did la- they did lose some depth trading for Kyrie. They lost some size in Dorian Finney-Smith in that deal. So, bringing in a guy like Nerlens Noel, letting Christian Wood play the four in some lineups, that would, made, I, I think, make their lineup... Uh, a bit more versatile, and, and I think Nerlens Noel can also slide his feet defensively on the perimeter, so yeah. it's not like teams could pick on him um, come playoff time. Right. But probably the most interesting part of today's show, this is something I saw, could just be BS, whatever, I still wanted to bring it to today's show. The NBA, they're possibly, they're contemplating adding a target score for a regular season and or, uh, playoff overtime games. Uh, I have a picture of Kobe here because, as we know, after he passed, rest in peace, in the All-Star game, they in the fourth quarter, they took uh, a target score of 24, added on to the team with the highest points. So as a tribute to Kobe, right? Would they do that? You know, I think 24 might be a good mark for the regular season if they were to add a target score to the overtime as, what would you say, an average team scores about 10 to 15 points in overtime? Yeah. So, I mean... It wouldn't mess with the record books too much. I think it actually, the NBA is probably looking to speed up the games. So that might even be better for the NBA. Uh, do you think, or what What are your thoughts on a, maybe a, a target score for <clears throat> overtime here in the NBA? Yeah, I saw this, uh, I think, yesterday or a few, a few days ago. Um, and just like the person who ever posted it, I don't agree with it because um, – they said the reason that they want to introduce an overtime game is to uh, is to decrease the management 
or the load that it has on players. And they mm-hmm. use Kawhi as an example. He had to play 46 minutes in a double overtime game uh, against the Kings uh, the other night. And I just don't get that. I mean, we all know Kawhi has a serious issue with load managing, but he, I mean, as Kawhi Leonard, he's never going to get called out for it. Um, you know, people already think that the league is going really soft as far as players sitting out games and, and every, you know, when they don't need to. And when you introduce an overtime rule just so the players, you know, I, I, I don't get it because they've never had it before. Uh, had they said, like, oh, you know, 90% of our players get hurt in overtime, so let's do this, that makes sense. But, um, you know, I, I, I feel like there are a lot of things that uh, – that Should be untouched? Yeah. I, I guess mean, when we're talking about the, the natural game of basketball exactly. as it was created. And, I, I mean, I also saw that they, were, they, that they were saying that, like, Adam Silver is kind of bringing in – is what's been bringing in a lot of these new rules, and he's more so coddling to the players than the entertainment of the fans. And I know there's a, there's a balance there, but there are some rules. Like, there, there's no reason to – I don't think there's a reason to introduce – and a target score, especially because there are some overtime games where, you know, you can win an over. I think the Cavs won an overtime game this, earlier this year, and they scored six points in overtime. So, yeah. Uh, and I, you know. I think, it, yeah, right. I mean, there's some teams that are super defensive, you know, or what if the team like, uh, like the Lakers and Anthony Davis and LeBron are both out on the same night, you know, they're lacking some star power offensively. Is that fair for them? Uh, you know, if, if they really just have a lot of glue guys and a lot of defensive guys out there to go out there and hit 24 when they're going up against a team like Dallas, who has Luka and Kyrie, right. um, you know, I, I think you got to keep it natural. There's some things in the game of basketball that we do have to keep untouched. And as you said, I mean, if there was some stat that said most the majority of players get hurt in overtime, mm-hmm. I would understand it. But there's not that. There's not a stat that says that. And why not leave it? You know, there's no point to change it. At that point, you're just doing something to do something. Right. I mean, uh, like, these guys are NBA athletes at the end of the day. Like, I mean, so when we say that, oh, yeah, we got to – we can we can make sure that they, you know, watch their, you know, how much they're putting on their bodies. But this is what they train their entire lives for. I mean, Kawhi played 46 minutes against Sacramento, and I believe it was a back-to-back. He played the, the next night. I think he played, like, 36 minutes yes. versus Denver and had 33 yeah. points. Uh, so it obviously didn't affect him. It's just – you know, he's been known to, to you know, use things like load management. But, I mean, you know, you look at somebody like Anthony Edwards, it, it doesn't affect him. I know there's an age difference there, but still, it's, I mean, this is what those guys train for, so. Yeah, you should, you know, most of these players are spending hundreds of thousand dollars on their bodies, especially the, the uh, higher talent in the league, mm-hmm. the more talented guys. So, they should be able to uh, with with uh, withstand, you know, the occasional night where they got to go into double overtime and play 40 minutes because you know I want to say year in and year out we probably get less than five double overtime games so it's not like these are often you know and that's what makes some of those games is super exciting is because when you get a double or triple overtime game it's you're glued to the tv and you want to see your team you know squeak out with a win right um but moving on you know we have the missing warriors the golden state warriors have steph curry Andrew Wiggins and Dray, uh, Draymond Green are all missing time as of right now. You know, Steph with a left leg injury that he suffered in mid-February. Uh, Wiggins right now, he has some personal stuff going on. So whatever that is, you know, it could be a death of a family member or mental issues, whatever it is, um, prayers up to Andrew Wiggins. But then Draymond Green had a knee injury that they were fearful he was going to miss a significant amount of time. But good thing for the Warriors, his MRI was cleared. He's expected to be back maybe as soon as tonight. But I'm going to say that for Steph and Wiggins, there's no target date as of now. Uh, but, you know, good things for them is, the, you know, Jordan Poole, Klay Thompson, that core over there that's remaining is keeping them afloat. They're the seventh seed right now. Yeah, um, I mean, the Warriors, they have all those guys have championship DNA. Um, they, I mean, they didn't really even bring in anybody new other than Dante uh, Domenicino, and he won a chip with the Bucks, even though he didn't play. He still knows what it takes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think they, in the Warriors' mind, they're probably just like, we just need to be healthy and show everybody why we're the uh, defending champs. And, I mean, Steph Curry obviously is arguably a top 10 player of all time. He's arguably the best point guard of all time. He's obviously the best shooter of all time. Um, you know, you can't bet against that in the playoffs. Klay Thompson, he, he, he's arguably the best shooter of all time as well. And then, uh, you know, Wiggins was very valuable in their playoff run last year. Um, Jordan Poole has definitely matured this season. Um, 
So, you know, they're still yeah. going to be a team, a, a fear team. I mean, they still are right now. It's just, you know, when you hear the Warriors, you're never even too sure your team is going to win no matter who they have on their <laughs> roster. Right. And, and, and um, you know, for this team to have all the injuries that they've had this season and for them to still be the seventh seed, you know, tells you a lot. You know, go, goes a lot. You know, we got to show a lot of praise to Steve Kerr over there for, for showing that he is a, a good coach in this league. Yeah. And, you know, I mean – there's a reason why this team is still a top five championship favorite in Vegas. We know how dangerous the Warriors could be. There's no other offense like the Warriors. There's so many little details and everything that the more and more you've been there, the more and more you understand that, okay, Steph Curry likes his pick this way, not this way, at this angle, not this angle. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in that Warriors system that uh, the rest of the league, you know, doesn't really understand. Right. But I guess very quickly just want to ask you, do you believe the Warriors can defend their crown? Obviously, we're going to talk about with them being healthy, but they've had a lot of injuries this year. They've had a lot of setbacks. They're going to have a, a, a big hill to climb in the playoffs, saying that they'll be a lower seed. Do you I think there's a chance they can defend their crown? Um, yeah, I mean, if they're if they're if they're healthy, uh, there's you can never count them out. Uh, obviously, like you said, the, the stakes will be stacked against them. But Clay, he, Clay has been really good lately. Um, you know, I think that's what, exactly what they needed, like the old Clay coming back. Um, Steph is one of those players nowadays. He comes back from injury. He's right back to where he was before, um, you know. And they're, the, the Warriors always have good defense, even though they're not the tallest team out there. They just have a lot of guys that are they, that buy into team defense. Um, you know, obviously, if they go up against, like, a Phoenix and Kevin Durant, that I don't see them winning that just because – um, you know, they aren't built for that type of, you know, matchup. But if they go up against, like, Dallas or even, like, the Lakers, I could for sure see them, you know, being able to beat those two teams or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, I'll, I'll say this, is because let's say they are the seven seed, right, right. or the eight seed. They'll be facing Denver or Memphis, most likely, in the first They'll round. They'll beat Memphis. They've beat Memphis. They've beat Denver a couple of times. I believe I... As crazy as it might sound, if it came down to a one-eight matchup, I still might take the Warriors over the Denver Nuggets. I would um, in the playoff series, you know, especially over Memphis. I would take them over Memphis without a doubt. But you know, for a team like this Warriors team, we know how talented they can be, and I don't think it's too far fetched to say they could beat a Memphis to go beat a uh, a Dallas team and then meet uh, Phoenix in the conference finals, and then anything can happen when you get to that point. Right. But moving over to Quinn Snyder. We talked about Nate McMillan a lot on the last episode and Joe Prutney, how he was going to take over as the interim head coach. Well, um, he didn't get a game under his belt. <laughs> the Atlanta Hawks immediately went out there and, and signed Quinn Snyder to a five-year deal of the team. And he's expected to be on the sidelines as soon as tonight at 7.30, which I forget who they play for. But what's your outlook for this, this Hawks team now that they have a, a veteran head coach like Quinn Snyder? Can they make that playoff push? You know, will they avoid the play-in? Or, you know, because, well, sometimes, I'll put it this way, sometimes we see with new coaches, the team gets like, uh, they're, they're rejuvenated. You know, yeah. they're like, okay, we got a new coach, let's go. And then they go on a, they go on a tear. Yeah. But yeah. sometimes we see, sorry, no. um, no. when when there's a new head coach or a new player, they need time to mesh. Do you mm-hmm. think that this Hawks team – is going to need that time to mesh, or do you think they're going to get going once Quinn Snyder steps up tonight? Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll probably they'll definitely take some time to mesh, I believe. Um, you know what? I think they'll actually be rejuvenated. I think Joe Prudney coached one game, and that was versus the yeah, Cavs, I think and so, they actually. blew the, get the Cavs out. Um, you know, I don't know what it was. I think Trey Young just really wasn't buying into Nate McMillan for whatever reason. Um, but they'll probably be rejuvenated at least for the rest of this season. They'll probably get to the play in. Um, and just in typical Quinn Snyder fashion, Clint Capello will be left on the island during the play in, play in game and get 27 28 dropped on his head. And you'll question whether he's a, de- a defender or even valuable to the team. Um, and then after that, the remaining four years of his contract, he'll probably, the Hawks will probably be a. Uh, I think uh, it'll always be a really good regular season yeah, team. Yeah, they'll, like, they'll be just like the Jazz team that he coached pretty much. Um, right. Except, you know, you have a worse defender than, uh, than Donovan Mitchell and Trey Young. DeJounte Murray. He's good, but you know he's not the head of the snake in this in, on this team. So he can he can never be that one option on their team, that that, that elite two way player. He is a good two two way player, but if Trey Young's the the head of the snake, there's just so much covering up you have to do just to hide him on defense. And he's really inconsistent when he starts shooting the ball if he's not getting to the free throw line. He's a good playmaker, but 
it's it's hard to kind of you need the perfect storm similar to that 2021 playoff run um i think they they went on when they went to the conference finals um you know where they play the knicks and then they play uh i don't even remember who they played in the second round it was the knicks then it was whoever the one seed was at the time oh it was philly yeah it was philly right. and yep. ben simmons had yep. a mental breakdown during that series which is the only reason they won and then they play you know the, the eventual milwaukee, champions yeah. in, in milwaukee so it will take a perfect storm but i you know i don't take anything away from quinn snyder though they'll, they'll probably be a top regular season team while he's their coach but uh i don't see i don't see them uh you know obviously winning a chip or anything. I think this will really prove to us fans who Quinn Snyder is as a coach. You know, how good is he? Because good coaches yeah. always find a way to uh, mask their flaws on their team. And the biggest flaw here is Trey Young's defense. You know, we know Trey Young can you know make up for it on the offensive end, but on those nights where Trey Young is 2 of 15 from the field, is this team going to be able to pick up uh, what Trey Young's not giving and come out with some wins? It's going to be interesting to see, but... I think it's still a good pickup for this Hawks yeah, team, yeah. having a veteran presence in that uh, um, in that head coaching spot. But Giannis is next. Injuries this year, obviously we know he sprained his wrist right before the All-Star break. He played one possession in the All-Star game and sat out. And after the All-Star break, he comes back, dealing with that sprained wrist, and he bangs his knee with another big, which I forget who. But basically, Giannis is this season. We know it's a stat that he's missed more games this season than any other season of his career so far. So Giannis, you know, there's no timetable for his return after banging his knee. But in the words of Coach Bud, it's nothing too serious. And we're seeing injuries are piling up to Giannis. He's been an Iron Man really his whole career. Should we worry about this Bucks team? You know, saying that Chris Middleton's had some injury issues, saying that Giannis has had some injury issues. Should we worry about this team come playoff time uh, because they're not all on the court together? No, uh, they want to chip together. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, uh, everybody, you know, Bobby Portis is really good. He's He, he was good for them last year um, in, the, in the playoffs. Uh, you know, I, I think what, they, what they've come to realize is that, you know, I think especially Giannis, he doesn't have to play 82 games for this team to win. Um, like he used to have to. Now he can rely on Drew Holiday, uh, Chris Middleton, Brooke Lopez, you know, Grayson Allen, Bobby Portis. He can rely on Jay Crowder. He can rely on these guys to get him. I think they're six and three without him. Yes. Um, so, you know, um, you know, especially because they like I said, they want a, a ring together. They know that come play playoff time, they're gonna do anything for one another. You know, they're gonna they're gonna lay their their bodies out on the line. Um, they're gonna play through anything, you know. Um, they're they're they'll be there and they'll be tough in the playoffs. Um, yeah, I think Giannis has even touched on it. Like he he you know he he doesn't feel the need to to rush back from these injuries. He wants to make sure he's a hundred percent. And you know, uh, yeah. I mean, when your team is on a fourteen game win streak, and I looked at it this morning, they are now the one seed in the Eastern Conference. Yeah. This Bucks team is on fire. They have the depth to. Uh, maintain, you know, a top seed in the East if Giannis needs to take a week or two to rest up for the playoff run, which that is the most important time of the season. Mm -hmm. uh, I did make a prediction after, it's a video called What We've Learned One Month In. One month into the season, I said that this was the best Bucks team of all time. And I still stand by that. I think when this team gets healthy, if Chris Middleton and Giannis can take the time they need to recover, you know, have a couple games to ramp up for the playoffs. Mm -hmm. I think this team is probably going to win another championship. I stood by that early in the year, and I do believe this is the best Bucks team of all time. Yeah. But regardless, I hope Giannis does come back soon, and he's healthy. But on this day, we're going to look throughout the NBA history on February 28th, which, shout out to your sister, if she's by chance listening, happy birthday to her. Mm -hmm. But on this day in NBA history, we're going to start all the way back in 1967 with Wilt Chamberlain. He missed his first field goal in four consecutive games to end his NBA record shooting streak of 35 consecutive field goals made. Yeah, then uh, just touching on that, Wilt, that's an insane, that's an insane <laughs> stat, especially when you look at prime Wilt. Played every. He actually played. He averaged more minutes per game than there were minutes in a game. Uh, was one of those seasons, especially. Yes. He averaged forty-eight point nine minutes a game. There are only forty-eight minutes in a game. But uh, yeah, in nineteen eighty-one, uh, Kyle Murphy on the Houston Rockets. He made his seventy-eighth consecutive free throw, setting what was then an NBA record. 
Um, it was later broken by Michael Williams uh, of the Minnesota, Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, who made 97 straight free throws. Uh, and obviously, that's over the span of games. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think that I think that that record currently stands still, which is surprising. Yeah. Saying that, like someone like Jose Calderon had that one year where he shot like 99 percent from the line. Yeah, and Curry, he's amazing. But 97 is still a heck of a feat. But then in 2003, Patrick Ewing, the New York Knicks legend, Hall of Famer, he was the first ever NBA lottery draft pick. Fun fact of the day. Um, In 2003, he had his jersey retired on this day in Madison Square Garden in front of his home team. Yeah, and uh, in 2013, uh, Joakim Noah uh, on the Chicago Bulls, he had 11 blocks and it went over to 76ers. Uh, which marked a really good individual performance for his career. And, you know, as anybody knows who's kept up with basketball for a while, Joe Kim Noah, uh, he almost won MVP by being a good defender. I think that was the year, too. Oh, yeah. I think that was when Derrick Rose got hurt. And that was, he was kind of, like, I guess their leader for the remainder of that season. Yeah. But uh, after that long list of news, you know, we had a lot of stuff to cover there. And, you know, we're about 26, 27 minutes in. But we're finally here with some of our predictions for the remainder of this season. You know, whether if it was a player, team, coach, or playoff success, we we both put together a list of five different things that we believe can happen for the remainder of the season. You know, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, are you ready? Yep. Um, we're going to start here. I'll start, and, and I'll give my one, and then you can give yours. Mm-hmm. But mine, I have that Toronto Raptors and the Los Angeles Lakers, they both turn up as teams. They both finish as top six seeds. And I believe Toronto here, we'll start with this, Jaka Poto, criminally underrated. And, and um, that team is starting to pick it up. I know they've lost two straight, but they won two straight before that. I believe right now they're the ninth seed in the East. And there's some teams in the East above them that I believe will probably have a, a bit of a fallout second half of the, of the season. I believe Toronto can turn up and they can avoid the play-in. For the Lakers, even with LeBron's injury, I trust that Lakers team even with Anthony Davis at the helm. You know, we have other teams that made big deals at the deadline, like the Clippers with Russ, Dallas with Kyrie, KD into the Suns. All three of those guys, they're big core pieces. Maybe not Russ, but those guys are core pieces where you got to have everybody fit around them when they come to your team. But with this Lakers team, you already had your core. You had Anthony Davis, LeBron James, and you just brought in complimentary pieces to fit around the core. And I believe when you bring in those complimentary pieces instead of the big stars, the the time to adjust and mesh together, it's a lot quicker. And I'm hoping LeBron James doesn't take too long to recover, but I believe both of these teams will turn up, be top six seeds, and miss the play-in. Yeah, and so my my first prediction actually is the Lakers will miss the playoffs. (laughs) Um, I I, I can't remember if I made this before or after the the news of LeBron's injury. I want to say it was maybe after, but that wouldn't have changed how I felt. Um, you know, I think it was a given LeBron was probably going to miss a game or two, um, obviously throughout the rest of the season, just because he is 38. Yes. Um, but you know, now that he's actually out, they, they said he's expected to miss, you know, maybe up to multiple, multiple weeks. Um, so, you know, had Anthony, Anthony Davis is the real X factor. He has these games where he'll put up 40 and 20 with like six blocks, and then he will have four straight games where he'll get, you know, 13 and eight on bad shooting, and then you'll forget he's out there. Um, You know, I think that happens far too many times when LeBron is out. Um, He usually does that when LeBron is playing, Um, you know, and and it it really just comes down to Anthony Davis, but Anthony Davis alone can't win you a, uh, um, can't win you multiple games, like, to finish out a season, especially trying to make the playoffs. And so what it really really comes down to is guys like D'Angelo Russell, D'Angelo Russell, we all know he was really inconsistent um, in Minnesota, which is why he asked for the trade. He um, he felt like he just didn't belong there. Um, but it, it, you got guys like Malik Beasley. He's a he's a good shooter. He's also inconsistent. The, this team is just full of guys who know their role, and I don't think those guys will step outside of their role. Um, you, the only other score you have outside of Anthony Davis is uh, D'Angelo Russell. Um, Malik Beasley, if he gets you 20, 25, that's really good. But, you know, Jared Vanderbilt, he might get you 10. Um, you know, Austin Reeves might get you, might get you, you know, 10 to 12. Um, but we'll have to see. It really relies on their defense. Right. No, I mean, this team has definitely showed a lot of promise. Vando, as LeBron would say, he's uh, been really that, that piece that they've missed on the defensive side of the ball for the Lakers. But 
Toronto, LA, I believe they both turned up. You believe the Lakers missed the playoffs. I guess my only question is, do you think they make the play in or miss the play in as well? If, see, this is what, what I thought about. If they were in the play in picture already, I would say, you know, they're, they're going to make the, you know, make the playoffs, I believe, but they're not even in the play in. Um, I think they're 12th right now. They're the 12th seed. Yes. Um, uh, I, they might have moved up after that win last or a couple of days ago, but at the, yeah, twelfth or the eleventh. Yeah, they're twelfth or eleventh, and the team above them is Portland. Portland, the way Damian Lillard's been playing, and you know after getting you know uh, Matisse Thybul and Cam Reddish at the deadline, they've been playing a lot better. Um, I think OKC lost one, and I think they're tied with OKC or like half a game up. With LeBron being out, this might be OKC's chance to sneak up above them. So it's it's really you know it's really against them right now for sure. Right, uh, but that's going to do it for our first one. Our second one, I'm going to open it up here. I believe, I guess this is a, more of a hot take than a prediction, but uh, I guess I'll put it this way. Nikola Jokic will win his third MVP, his third straight. He's going to join Bill Russell, Wilt, and Larry Bird as the only players to do that in an NBA history. Uh, but, I mean, I already, I, I put it on here more so as a hot take that Jokic has already won his third straight MVP. Even though there's 20 or so games left where guys like Joel and Giannis and Tatum have a chance to be in that conversation, Ja too. I just think Jokic being five and a half games above everybody in the West and and you know dominating the way he that he is, Jokic has won his third straight MVP. Yeah. Uh so for me, I said that, that the Knicks turn up and they're gonna be a fear team in the playoffs. Um, the difference between this Knicks team and I think the twenty twenty one team is that they have somebody to take the pressure off of Julius Randle. Um R.J. Barrett, I think that was only his second season. Uh, R.J. Barrett, let's get this out the way. He's not. He's not. Uh, he, I don't think he'll develop into the star player that the Knicks were hoping. No. Um, but he's he he can have these games where he's above average. Um, and that's uh, you know that wasn't what they needed in their second best player. They go out and get Jalen Brunson, and Jalen Brunson has been everything they asked for this season. Uh, arguably, should have been an All Star. I think they've won six or seven in a row, and they just had a really impressive win on the Boston Celtics. Um, this team has been dedicated to defense since Tom Thibodeau became the coach. Um, but it looks like now that their offense is finally catching up with their defense. Julius Randle, it looks like he's been able to kind of uh, take his differences aside with the New York fan base and everything and, and really start playing really good. Um, and, it, and this team is even scarier when you, you know, you remember they have, they do have guys like Derrick Rose on their bench. Derrick Rose was the only reason. Well, he doesn't to, play, but yeah, he, he could. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. They could bring him out during the playoffs. He was the only reason that they were able to take a game off the Hawks during that year. Um, and, you know, this team, they just, they have good guys, good 3 and D guys like Quentin Grimes. RJ Bear can go off occasionally. Um, but, you know, they're just. They're just a good team. Uh, they play a good team brand of basketball. Kind of like a college now. basketball team. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, <laughs> Julius Randle was an all-star. Uh, yes. Jalen Brunson should have been an all-star. So, you know, they, they, they do have, I guess, the star power. Not probably what the Knicks fans were hoping for, but they do have it. Right. And, and I think, I guess, the biggest question is can they perform playoff time? It's because Julius Randle kind of shrank um, two years ago when he made it. Maybe the lights were too bright, but maybe and, it was Trey Young getting to him. But uh, I think yeah. this year what makes them different also is that they do have Jalen Brunson. Yeah. Who he's a way better second option. He's like Jakob Poldo where he's super underrated for what he brings to a team. And he is their second best player. And I think that that is going to go farther than – excuse me, farther than people think for them um, in the playoffs. Yeah, and like I said, I think the only reason that Julius Randle, uh, I guess, shrank uh, – during that playoff run was because, you know, he got them to the playoffs. Everybody knew Julius Randle was going to, he was going to shoot it. He wasn't really looking to pass it um, because he didn't really have anybody to pass it to, especially on offense. But like I said, now that they have a more dynamic offense, their defense creates offense as well. Um, You know, I I bet they're praying that they play the the Hawks again so they can get their revenge. I don't know why you're uh, uh, discrediting the all-star shooter in Evan Fournier um, back th- two years ago. But, you know, we'll, we'll move on. We'll move on. No, no. Well, we have joking. the same role now. He'll sit and watch the game. He just has better seats. <laughs> right, and more money. But uh, my number three, I have a either James Harden, Bradley Beal, or Damian Lillard will be spending their last these last 20 games uh, with this team. They're going to find a new home. One of these guys will to start next season. You know, James Harden, he's been rumored to go back to Houston as there's rumors that he always hangs out with Houston players and he's always working out with them. And that was his home for 10 plus years, it felt like. So I wouldn't doubt, you know, the rumors there. Bradley Beal, you know, we, you know, we know that the 
Washington Wizards love to just be okay. They're like the Indiana Pacers. They love to just be okay. You know, sell the tickets enough to bring fans in and be decent. But, you know, does Bradley Beal, does his patience give out? Does he want to demand a trade? Same thing with Damian Lillard. Will his patience finally run out? You know, even though he just came out and said that I'm not leaving Portland, I'm going to win a championship here, which that's delusion. But <laughs> I, I predict that one of these guys, what either their patience is going to run out or the the 76ers fizzle out in the playoffs and all the blame uh, stays away from Embiid like it has, and it's going to go strictly on Harden, and Harden might want to get out. I believe one of these star players will find a new home in uh, 2023. Yeah, and so for my third prediction, I say that uh, or it's a kind of like a two-part prediction. Kawhi, is, uh, he's obviously returning to his old form, but come playoff time, he will be that old Kawhi, the finals MVP Kawhi, and he this also makes the Clippers a dangerous team come playoff time. Obviously, on paper, the Clippers are already a dangerous team, but uh, I just watched Kawhi Leonard the other night score 33 points and almost close out the game for the Clippers if, you know, obviously uh, one of the best big men of all time and Nikola Jokic didn't have 40, 20, and uh, I think like 12. Yeah. Uh, You know, Kawhi, what I really watched, Kawhi, he was moved. He was demanding. Like, this was a guy who was demanding the ball on any post up. Um, I don't know why they had Jamal Murray on him. First of all, Jamal Murray, he was he was in a in a uh, he was in prison. Um, but this was somebody, this was the Kawhi who was demanding the ball. He was taking his, he's taking his time getting to the, his spots. He was making every, uh, every, he was taking advantage of every, uh, Opportunity. mistake that yeah. the defense made. Yeah. Um, you know, and this was also a game where Paul George was really looking to just move the ball out of his hand. So when you get uh, locked in Paul George, Russell Westbrook didn't play the entire fourth quarter or overtime. And you could say, well, if he played, then the Clippers win this game. And this is also on the back-to-back after playing a double overtime game versus Sacramento. Um, we already know what type of coach Tyron Lue is. He doesn't need much to succeed, but he has this roster to work with. Um, you know, I think this team and Kawhi will really be um, – will really show why they are all potentially uh, title favorites. Yeah, so we'll move over to our number four predictions. I am predicting that this is going to be the best play-in ever. Uh, you know, right now when you have, uh, you know, teams like, it, well, well, we'll start here in the East. For the East right now, we're not talking about where we think it'll end, but right now it is Miami, Atlanta, Toronto, and Washington. All four of those teams, Atlanta, well, all four of those teams have their questions, but all four are talented teams. You know, in any one-game scenario, Bradley Beal can go out and give you 40, and boom, they take out the Miami Heat from the playoffs. So in the East alone, very exciting. In the West, you got Golden State, which should be revamped. They'll have all their stars back. You have Utah, who's been the Cinderella story of the season. Minnesota, who they could be explosive when healthy. They need a cat back, and you know they need all their guys back at the same time. And also New Orleans, we know how dominant they can be. At one point, they were the number one seed when healthy with Zion and Brandon Ingram and McCollum. We know how dangerous all eight of these teams can be. So it's all a matter of just being healthy at the right time. My only thing here is that, uh, well, I believe that the reason why, you know, these teams are here and and the reason why I think it's the best play in ever is J.J. Reddick said this on one of his podcasts. He said that parity creates delusion. And when you have these play-in teams where 10 teams can possibly be in the running for the playoffs, a lot more teams have a chance. And that, you know, that gets rid of the tanking that we do see in the NBA, unless you're the Spurs. So... When you have this parity, teams always believe they have a chance. And that's why Washington and Portland hold on to their star players because they have a chance to make the playoffs. And I believe, you know, with how talented all eight of these teams are, it's going to create for a very fun and very uh, uh, maybe dramatic uh, play-in for us fans. Yeah, and uh, my fourth prediction is that the Mavericks are going to disappoint in the playoffs. Um, I think before the Kyrie trade, they didn't have enough to – Um, to get back to where they were last year. Um, Or, I mean, they had the same team, but, you know, every year you want to try and get better in some way. Uh, They really didn't, other than, I think, Christian Wood, they got him. But after the Kyrie trade, they gave up a lot to get Kyrie, which a lot of defense. Um, We all know Kyrie is not a two-way player. He's a one-way player. He's an offensive player. So is Luka. Um, I think these two won't have enough time to really mesh and reach their full potential uh, by the time the playoffs roll around. And on top of that, they don't have a big man to name. Uh, Christian Wood plays like he's 6'5". Uh, um, 
And, you know, unless they go out and get like a Serge Ibaka or Nerlens Noel, which won't even really help them that much. It'll just, you know, instead of the other team scoring 135 points, they'll score 115 or maybe 120. Right. But, uh, you know, I just don't think that this Mavericks team is constructed to make a deep play- playoff run, even though they, they do have, uh, you know, arguably two of the most popular players in the league right now. Um, and I think Jason Kidd is starting to realize this. He's actually he's he's been voicing his his frustrations with the team, um, which could actually be you know instead of they're at the team, they're more so at the way that the roster is constructed. He might have felt like they had a better chance with the people that they had before the Kyrie trade. Um, and like I said, after the trade, they lost a lot of defense. They got a lot of shot making, but uh, shot making doesn't get you anything when you lose a one forty to one forty two shootout. So. Yeah, I, I guess they literally have to grow up, as in the words of Jay Kidd. Yeah, but you know this team, I guess last year they did have DFS, but last year we didn't think they would make that run, and I guess well, how great is Luca going to be? I guess is uh, the question here for this year again. Yeah, and I mean they also did have uh, you know Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson. Then what he was playing really really good. Um, you know, like you said, they had Dorian Finney Smith. Uh, uh, Davis Bertans, um, you know, I don't know, Maxi Kleber, I think, are they hurt? Are they, are um, they? Davis Bertans is just not playing. He, he's playing the uh, Courtney Lee role late oh. in his career where he's just on the bench. Okay, well, <laughs> well, they need to look into playing him or something because uh, <laughs> they need anybody over 6'3 to, to get out on the court. I guess um, they think that we can play better defense than Davis Bertans, which uh, at this point, you know, might not be a bad prediction. <laughs> well, they need to figure out something quick, or they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> lose in, in five or six in the first round. No, I definitely see them going out and picking up a Nerlens Noel. I think that makes the most sense, especially because Nerlens Noel and J Kid. Uh, it seems that they're linked. So maybe you know, off the top of my head, I can't think why they would have a connection. Uh, but who knows? You know, I, I think they do need a big if yeah. they want to make a push for the playoffs. Yeah. But my final prediction is that it's too good to be true for the Boston Celtics and the Denver Nuggets. You know, if I've learned one thing in life, it's this. If it's too good to be true, then likely it is, right? It's, it's likely uh, too good to be true. Uh, but for both of these guys, they were the one seeds for a long time. Boston just got demoted to the two seed. But Denver, they're five and a half games above everybody in the West. They're cruising. They've had no health issues this year. And, I, you know, not that I wish injuries on them. They just got – they've just – gotten very lucky and you need luck to be a very successful team yeah. um but in all honesty i just trust the field more you know if you had to tell me to bet on the number one seed uh, the denver nuggets in the west or another team to come out of the west i'm taking the field right with all the talent in the west and for the east for boston this might raise some eyebrows you know when you have jason tatum Jay, uh, jalen brown who took down the bucks last year and they went to the finals and took the warriors to six games they after beat the nets yeah, beat the Nets in four. You know, they swept them. Um, Boston, I mean, they have everything that you want for a good team. But like I said, if it seems too good to be true, then it is. And, and I believe, again, I think I just trust the field more. Give me Giannis to take down the Bucks this year with a healthy Chris Middleton as they went to seven last year without Chris Middleton. So give me the Bucks with Chris Middleton and their crew to take down the, the Celtics, I guess, is I'm trusting the field more in the East and the West over these two dominant one seeds. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I've been saying that for a while that I don't really trust Denver in the playoffs. I feel like they're definitely more of a um, a regular season team, especially because in the playoffs it's more isolated basketball. You know, I don't think Jokic – Jokic is a – he's an above average, you know, defender for his size, but, you know, he's not going to be able to, to stay in front of everybody for four quarters. And Jason Tatum has too many disaster classes in the playoffs. Um, he'll have his – you know, he'll have 44 points one game and then go three straight games where he's – he has 19 points mm-hmm. on 27 shots, so um, it's bad when Jalen Brown is their best player. But, right. Uh, and, well, before you get into yours, I was just going to quickly say that this could be a, another year like the Dallas Mavericks in 06 when we had the We Believe Warriors. Mm-hmm. I believe this could be another year where Denver's the one seed, and we could possibly see them get upset by a team that is the eight seed. Now, the Nuggets are a great team. Um, they have arguably the best player in the world in Nikola Jokic, who, someone who I on this list I said is going to win his third straight MVP. But if they match up with a team like the Warriors, uh, good luck. You yeah. know, is all I'm gonna say in the first round. Yeah, and I mean, if Jokic wins those MVPs for offensive stats, not the defensive uh, stats. Right. We all know. So, uh, and my fifth and final prediction is that Greg Popovich is going to retire at season's end um, with their tank for Wimbenaya in full effect. It's going to, you know, it 
he might feel that it only feels right to retire and kind of, you know, help bring in this new group of, you know, coaches and players. Um, there's really no reason, no incentive for him to actually still be coaching other than for the love of the game, uh, which he might actually have still at, you know, I think almost, what, 80 years old? Yeah, he's old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. But, I mean, I, I, I pros- if they, you know, if they somehow do get Wimbenai, I could see him coming in as like a, a – um, a team official kind of teaching him a few pointers, but he won't, I think he'll step down as the head coach. Um, I think people were kind of expecting this, you know, last year, especially after they traded DeMar DeRozan. Um, but yeah, I think the the Spurs Greg Popovich run is over. Um, they'll try and find somebody else to carry that torch, which I'm sure they're, they, they have in-house uh, coaches. I mean, every coach who's been under Greg Popovich has done really good on their team. So I'm sure they'll have somebody, you know, take that mantle over, yeah. uh, and, you know, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great coaches that come under, um, you know, Greg Popovich, like Bud, like yeah. Mike Malone. There's and, and you know, there's a Ime lot of Udoka great, when he was coaching. Ime Udoka, you know, there's a lot of great coaches that have taken uh, that that were under Greg Popovich and have you know flourished in their own teams. Uh, Greg Popovich, we'll get into it maybe Thursday, which we'll talk about in a sec. But he's, in my opinion, probably the greatest coach of all time. But you know, that's arguable with. Phil Jackson and Pat Riley. There's a lot of coaches out there, but he's without doubt one of the best of all time. He's probably the most iconic Spurs member of all time. Yeah. I guess when we look at their franchise, and you know the Spurs, they've always had the the best developmental team in the league. Maybe sure. aside from the the Heat now, because the Heat just find bums off the street and play them <laughs> like Max Struess, an undrafted dude out of nowhere, and he can you know he's a rotational player now, but. The Spurs have always had one of the better developmental teams. I think whether if it's – I know Becky Hammond took a job elsewhere, but whoever they choose to step in and be that head coach, I think, like you said, Popovich will step away as head coach, but I think he'll still be there to, I guess, monitor for a season or two yeah. to make sure they're heading in the right direction. Especially if they get, like, a Wimbenaya or a Scoot Henderson. Uh, he'll, you know, th- th- those two, even Brandon Miller, are potential generational talents. Uh, they get either th- one of those three – you know, I'm sure he'll try and point them in the right direction, the Spurs way, um, which, you know, who, would, who wouldn't want to be coached by Greg Popovich? I guess only DeJounte Murray, right? Right, right, right. I mean, especially, you know, with, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, with this Spurs team also, you do have – I was going to – it looked a lot nicer when they had Yaka Polo, yeah. saying that you had Sohan and you had um, Keldon Johnson and Yaka Polo, but – Malachi have, Branham, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Blake Wesley. They know, they awesome. have they have a lot of young pieces there. They just they're probably you know three to five years away from being legit contenders, um, or playoff contenders. Yeah, right. But they need to they need to this first domino to fall, especially if Popovich retires. They need to get that guy in the draft. Yeah, but that really is gonna do it for today's show. You know, if you guys enjoyed, make sure to support us down below. Hit that like button. Hit comment down below. Let us know what you guys think about our uh, predictions. You know, are we bogus for these predictions? You know, or, or do you agree with all of them? You know, let us know down below in the comments. And, of course, if you haven't already, hit that big red subscribe button as we continue to grow this channel. The views have been off the charts. We just need to hit that subscribe button a bit more, right? But, uh, I mean, any last thoughts about today's show? Any last thoughts? Maybe a preview for Thursday as we have a big show coming up. Yeah, uh, Thursday we're, we're in for a really exciting show. Um, I think everybody's going to go, going to like this little uh, drive to memory lane. Um, mm-hmm. You know, series that we're going to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, make sure you guys tune in Thursday and uh, like, like he said, uh, we love the support, we love the views. Um, you know, keeps hitting the subscribe button, keeping the like button. Um, you know, we really, we really like uh, where this channel is going. Yeah, I, I, the channel's growing off the charts. I mean, especially, you know, we can always see the advanced analytics, but, you know, we can't thank you guys enough for all the support. But until Thursday, uh, stay happy, stay healthy. We're out. <laughs>